Hello and welcome everybody to our best practices for achieving optimal occupancy webinar. I see we have many participants here. I'm excited to have this training. Go to the next slide, please, where we're going to introduce our learning objectives. So HUD has engaged with uh, IEM, in short for Innovative Emergency Housing Management. I introduced Krista as a team member from IEM and myself, Siglinda Chambliss, as the presenter for today's session. This is an interactive training session, so please participate in the polls and ask as many questions you feel you need to have answered. Of course, our learning objective for today will be to understand our current tools available to analyze issues with current occupancy, learn resources and sources available to achieve optimal occupancy, and gain an understanding on best practices for optimal occupancy, considering merging units or repositioning. I warn you, this is a heavy session. There's a lot of new stuff in itself. The introduction of concepts and materials have in itself many different other available tools on how to exchange. So we just want to make sure that we are giving you the best uh, information in a nutshell through this particular webinar, understanding that there's more to be explored. Next slide, please. We have some housekeeping rules. Remain muted during the webinar unless invited to unmute. Ask questions in the Q&A section throughout the presentation. You also have your chat. They will be addressed at intervals during the webinar or at the end, depending on time availability and always in writing. The webinar is recorded and will be posted on the HUD Exchange website at a later date. Next slide. All right, let's slide in. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you just for a moment before we get Please. started. We have a fo um, some folks in the chat saying that they're not able to see the slides. I don't know, Krista or Olvin, if you can just double check that the right slides are kind of, I'm seeing them on my end, but I just want to make sure all participants can see them in fact. Thank you, Helena. That. Yeah, let's check that. Is, able, is everybody able to see, follow through? Have you interacted or acclimated yourself to the screen? Do you see your microphone? The chat. Okay, I'm getting I'm getting other folks saying that they can see. So it sounds like it's a, a unique experience here for this individual. So let me just see if I can um chat them and sort it out, and then you can continue. Thank you. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Helena. All right, we cannot start out the presentation without highlighting again on the current hot occupancy tool, in particular the PIH notice 2021-25. I want to say that this is the uh, fifth presentation in this series on occupancy. So we are just going over the highlight. There is an in-depth webinar on 2021-25 notice. So please take your time and refresh and go back, or perhaps this particular section is just enough for you. Since we do not know how many years of experience you bring uh, as a participant, we try to be as much in depth as needed. But again, this is just an overview. Next slide, please. All right, in general, this particular notice has guidelines for occupancy in public housing. In particular, of course, what and how to report in the PIC IMS system to show the accurate status of a unit and it calculates the occupancy percent for your authority. So when your local HUD office communicates with you, this is essentially what they're referring back to. Then we have, of course, the separate types of unit status and subcategories, and proper identification leads to correct funding, which we will discuss in the next slide, please. The categories, there are four major categories in case we have not memorized them yet. You don't have to, it's on the slide. It's either in the occupied category, it's a vacant category, it's a vacant with HUD approved category, or non-dwelling. The descriptions underneath are provided in short. These particular categories, again, are critical to have properly identified to help with the operating subsidy 
calculation for your authority and also is in particular the vacant hut approved some of those as you go into in depth of the notice and when you review the chart come with funding and without funding so you want to make sure if you really want to maximize funding operating receipt to your housing authority you want to go through this process and get these particular units properly identified next slide please these are the subcategories that are identified in the PIH notice. And again, the notice goes in very much in depth in description what all these mean in particular categories for the subcategories, whether uh, they are you know, used for other purposes, what kind of vacancies there may be, especially undergoing modernization or what we currently are experiencing out there, natural disasters and or market conditions because this presentation is touching on those particular issues then special use units that also are attached with funding and i have to remind you with time limitations as well whether a unit is approved for one year or three year up to five years and we want to again make sure that we work closely if there are some finance people and program people in the in the cat in the attendance here work together because these two pieces go hand in hand from the program side what is being done in PIC versus what finance sees in in regards to financial results or receipts from HUD next slide please the protocol for PIC updates and approvals this is just a short summary the PIH notice identifies it for you. You submit the written request. You have to explain the reason for change and here be as descriptive as possible. It depends on your local hot office staff, how much information is needed or necessary. Provide a schedule for placing units back online because there will be questions. How long will this take you in order to determine the type of timeline you have available to have units in, in mod rehab status. Re the required documentation can vary. It can also include in some cases where you have to provide evidence that you have a PO or a contract or that you have issued an RFP. And then of course, being able to scan and email the documentation to the field office. When the documentation is all submitted, the field office will review and approve that can take up to 30 days. And when you receive this uh, particular letter, you will be invited to make the changes in PIC. So again, be mindful if this is a process, which you do not do at the end of the year or once a year, this is something that you evaluate on an ongoing basis monthly to scrub your data. And then, of course, you are required to maintain your approval letters as some of them have renewal dates and you do want to have those readily available for you to remind you of additional tasks that you may need to perform. Next slide, please. This particular item, although it's in the category of tools, it's not necessarily a tool, but it's currently used to assess your performance. So the current physical condition score, physical assessment subsystem or pass in short is how we are evaluated at the housing authority level, how well we do. Next slide, please. So again, this is just an overview on this. There's training out there. We have touched on this in our other presentations from one through four and discussed pass in more depth. But in general, it is holding housing authorities responsible that their units are safe, sanitary, and good repair. We are required to have our units maintained under what we call in short HQS standards for inspections. And then, of course, the inspections are following the uniform physical condition standards, or in short, UPCS. And then at the end, we are scored on essentially the condition of those units, and it creates a composite score for every AMP, of which, of course, when we submit our financial data schedule, it takes all of these and puts it in a a uh, composite score for us to know what our pass score is as part of our FOS overall score. So this is just a refresher and a reminder. It is complex. Uh, there is separate training out there on this particular tool. You find everything on the HUD exchange. So please take advantage of that. 
to brush up or become more familiar with the details. Next slide, please. This is just again a highlight on what are the REAC inspection main factors for inspections. And it's always driven by site, the building exterior, your systems, your common areas, and the units. So you want to make sure that whatever you do at the local level and with your maintenance team and operations team that have eyes on the property, have some sort of maintenance preventative maintenance plans that address these particular conditions and try to mirror somewhat the REAC inspection. Again, we had these in the earlier webinars. This is just a reminder, but you just always want to have somebody on what we call eyes on the on the trophy and say, these are the type of conditions we need to pay attention to in order to maximize your scores. Units that fail the REAC inspections are not readily available for housing. So ultimately, two major things happen. We are unable to house people. And then of course, we are not able to necessarily receive the necessary funding that we need to operate the, the units. Next slide, please. This is just a reminder on the scoring system. For the most part, uh, we are hanging out in standard performance. It's, it's a good area to be. You see the scores from 60 to 89, uh, making differentiation between the 79 uh, mark break as a standard performer versus a higher standard performer or the high performers that consistently have 90% 90, 90 of their scores or 90 uh, uh, over the three years. And one area we want to stay away from is the sub substandard and troubled because it comes with other additional conditions placed upon HUD and oversight and administrative burden that you may have to go through in order to come out of this particular status. Next slide, please. Conditions in unit turn time. Why is this again important to understand from the scoring to use the information? I have alluded to having a routine preventative maintenance plan. And when you don't have those plans in place, or there are holes in the plans, then the units over time will deteriorate and will, of course, generate more work orders complaints by your tenants that you have to tend to. You have more work orders to handle and open and close, which can be an administrative burden. So sometimes just evaluating and reading a management report on work orders, how many there are and how many different categories since software really has gotten very savvy that allows us with handheld devices to quickly catalog those issues. You want to be able to use those kind of information data points to your advantage to help with addressing so the unit does not become vacant because somebody doesn't cannot live in their code enforcement uh, coming in and shutting it down for you or deteriorating where you have a long-term vacancy. So all these pieces kind of lead into that. Deterioration over time of course, creates more unit turn, more work for the team that they may be locally overwhelmed to be able to handle in-house that requires now a different strategy. And you may have to consider outsourcing just to keep up with the demand. And ultimately, when a unit is not turned and it's not available for occupancy, one, it doesn't house people and it does not generate revenue as we were discussing. We need those resources in order to maintain operations of the units. This ultimately an, is an accumulation at some point that leads to a low score, which then requires more frequent inspection. So all these pieces are kind of interrelated, joined at the hip, as we say, and we want to evaluate the root causes to those kind of matters so we can better understand occupancy, vacancy, and unit turn time. Next slide, please. Low scores and the impact on funding, I have alluded to some, so this is just kind of summarizing some of the verbiage that I already used. Low scores require much resources. Why? 
when you have much of the vacancy, you need more staff time, overtime, more materials. We are experiencing in the market increase in supply. Materials are more costly. Anytime a disaster occurs, you pay more on materials. So this is not something that we want to experience, but it's part of the cycle and it's part of the condition. You want to make sure that when you have access to a five-year capital fund program, when you have decent amount of funding that just doesn't, well, like small agencies uh, can go right from 1406 to the property, but a uh, larger agency, you may have adequate resources where you can make these funds available when you address your root cause, put an RFP out there for vacancy turn and allow to help your team, your maintenance team to turn these units faster. Vacant units draw, of course, no rent. And, uh, you know, depending on your subcategory st status that you put in PIC may also not receive the necessary operating subsidy to help you cover operating expenditures. And then the occupancy rate in itself, we drive less operating subsidy or more concerns from the local hot office. What are you doing to to turn the, the, the needle, to bring up the curve, to provide more occupancy opportunities for needed individuals. And then of course, sometimes when we are unable to cure these and they become so expensive, there may not even be enough funds available, especially when we hit the troubled status and may have to look to other avenues to actually take care of our issue, especially when we have a disaster. So we go more in depth about that, but I want you to realize these pieces are interrelated, they're connected and um, have a broader discussion around, hopefully with your team, if that's one of the issues that you're experiencing. Next slide, please. All right, I want to pause just for a second. Reminder, this is now going into the section where we are discussing best industry and practices and tools. There, this is a heavy session. Please make sure that you are using your chat and your Q&A and ask those questions as needed. We also will have two polls and we look for active participation in the polls. You are here with your peers. You're learning amongst your peers. We love to hear from every one of you and share your story if you're experiencing any of these issues that I'm being addressing in the next slides. Next slide, please. All right. So overall, the concept of the operating fund rule when we went into asset management uh, projects was to look at the private sector and learn from the private sector how they uh, actually conduct property management. One of those uh, items is actually saying that, hey, we are a landlord. Not only are we a public housing landlord, but we want to have just the same effects of our tenants that we see or experience in our private sector. And so therefore, we want to give that kind of customer service and relationship to our tenants, just like any other landlord would do. We work on our curb appeal. What does what do your pictures look like on the website? Uh, do you give something in your area that looks better than in the in the other neighboring county or uh, another community? Do you know? Do what you can to spruce up and keep the property clean. Become familiar with the federal, state, and local requirements. I say that because relationship building and how these pieces work, where you can receive funding how your code enforcement works, how your city government works, the inner workings with the housing authority. So it's good to understand, of course, these three main sectors that we are regulated by or have access to that can support the housing authorities. The next item we are looking to evaluating processes and understanding again, root causes for occupancy issues when we cannot quickly move out or move in individuals. I know we have, we're not talking about the ones where we have more issues. We're talking about normal move outs and move in processes where we may need to evaluate and do a flow chart and say, is there something duplicated? Can we be more efficient? We know every day that a unit is down is going to affect 
our data to some degree, including financials. During that process, we can see what our neighboring communities or the private industry is doing, which of course many of them have gone to online payments and or only taken checks and money orders, not at the site level, but through a third party. So this is something that you may want to evaluate and say, is a good amount of our tenants ready to take this online and practice it? I think COVID has given us a lot of good uh, information and had changed or forced us to change on how we are implementing and uh, just our business practices and how we communicate with our tenants because we were not in the office. Under the CARES Act, we had many opportunities to update our systems and hopefully this was one of those matters that you considered doing in taking payments online. The same with the online work orders, private industry has links on the website or phone numbers where you can actually call in your work order or report a work order need online. Is this something that you have evaluated doing to make it easier for those tenants that have a cell phone that are more tech savvy and uh, be able to reduce the kind of foot traffic in your office to focus on other things? And that, of course, will speed up the process how maintenance requests are handled a little bit more promptly because through a routing process, work orders can be more efficiently routed to the, the right individual, the right person, a maintenance supervisor to actually then plot out the demand for the day, what to work on with the maintenance crew to get these things taken care of real quick. You can also work on open communications with your tenants. Now, you know, there's two types of communication we know. Usually, you know, we, we may say, you know, that just causes another uh, just complaint session. That's not necessarily. We want to show that we care about our tenants and we want to hear from them. Find a leader in the community and then have them be the, the tool for the tenants an avenue for the tenants to speak up to say, this is what's happening. This is what we would like to see in our communication. And this is what we would like to have addressed uh, as we see uh, as a tenant need. So do what you can in every effort to improve that open communication, develop the maintain robust tenant portal. With the tenant portals, especially on the COVID again, the kiosks were introduced and it were funded, were an eligible cost under the CARES Act funding. If you had that opportunity and actually had one of those, but you know, consider maybe mini sessions for on the spot training or tr at the receptionist to be very savvy and helping upfront when the tenant comes in the client and then can, can on the fly assist the tenant if they have little startup problems by using the tenant portal or call mini sessions, just brainstorming and bring me a tenant council in and just have to train the trainer and bring the tenant and say, look how easy it is to upload a document to use through the tenant portal or in your management office in general. Now, of course, the reporting, the reports that you can create and help monitor your property management performance you want to critically evaluate if those management reports, one, the standardized reports, give you the information you really want, or do you need to tweak them because you want them better aligned with those kind of scoring tools that HUD uses? And so, therefore, the information that you receive out of those reports are really more useful for you and your team. Next slide. We're not done yet. Sometimes, like I was saying, a management report may not capture the data you want. You want to find out what is it that is really applicable and interesting to me that I want to turn the curve on this particular item and you want to see how the data can be extracted out of the system. Talking to software developers, if the data points are in the system, you can get a report. So it's not that, it's just being able to brainstorm to know what kind of information you want out of the system. And that is when you look to the technology and the software that you're using 
of course, we know some of it can be expensive. Some of it uh, may not be as user friendly, but you really want to be very critical about that where you put your money and the advantages on the type of technology that you're using. You want to also consider potentially a neighboring housing authority or another housing authority to do a peer review on your housing authority. There's nothing wrong when you use your dashboard and you find who is a, a good performing housing authority or ask your local hot office and say, hey, look, take a look at my my department. What is it that we are not doing? Why are you so successful? Why can't I meet that benchmark? You know, don't be afraid to ask your peers to lend you a hand and uh, help you with the benchmarking process. Of course, financial feasibility to be able to pay incentives to staff to meet and benchmarks becomes a challenge. Right now, we would say that employees may still have the upper hand in the market, do not want to come into the office and work, uh, or staff that we do have what we say boots on the ground, labor on the ground, like maintenance. When we tell them this is the benchmark we need to meet, what can we do to incentivize our staff to meet those benchmarks instead of just having a pat on the back? And sometimes that's all we can do, I understand, but it's just really critically thinking about it, how we can incentivize, which is permissible. We want to be proactive and demand forecasting. Sometimes the data points do tell us on average, how many units we turn in a month or how many individuals we house during a month and what the demand would look like. Is this an ongoing regular routine monthly demand? Is this an outlier demand? Have a plan for those particular items so you can address from a plan A to a plan B and sometimes a plan C that we have to go to when we are pressed for more unit turns. Any data, we say knowledge is power. You will be better equipped with knowledge. You can address actions and you can repeat because it becomes a plan that can be enforced over and over and just replicated based on your experience data points. And again, I was saying, talk to your peers, have a understanding in the with your local hot office where you can go. I mentioned the hot dashboard in our resource slide that we have at the end of the presentation. You will see the link for the hot dashboard, but you can go to any region and then essentially click on any of the housing authorities to see seek out the high performers. So I want to pause right here for a minute because these two slides in itself were loaded. And we want to see if there was anything else that maybe you can contribute on best practices that you have considered doing and you want to share with your peer group. Anybody? Again, don't be shy. These are all housers. These are all your peers. Think about it as we move through the presentation. No worries. We have plenty of opportunities. Next slide, please. All right. Good time for a break. We're taking a poll. These polls are yes or no. Very easy. They're open for a minute or minute and a half. And to two minutes, the poll is open for two minutes. So you have plenty of time. It's easy to answer a bubble, yes or no. So you have three questions or you, you routinely making your pick corrections, routinely meaning really every 30 days, you're evaluating your data points, yes or no. Do you need pick training? Still a good question. We have many new individuals in this industry that join us and may not have had the opportunity to receive PIC training. So yes, no, we would like to just have that data point. And do you have management reports that give you your occupancy numbers? Do you have something that you feel adequately allows you to review your occupancy numbers? You know every day what is happening on your site and how you need to spend your resources or your time. Simple yes or no. We have another minute open. Take the time. Fill in the bubble. 
And then when the poll closes, we will be able to share the results quickly and open up the microphone to share any of your experiences either to those three questions or the previous best practices that we talked about. All right, just 15 seconds left before we close the poll. It's about done. Poll is closed and we will see the results fairly quickly. All right, so question number one. Yes, and I'm glad to see that answer that many of you uh, pretty much from those that answered 50% of in your group are saying we are doing this. So you are seeing the importance of that. And I'm sure local heart office has also reminded you to uh, update your PIC data. Do you need PIC training? So about a third of you said yes. I know there is a very big comprehensive uh, PIC guidebook out there, but I would suggest that you reach out to your local hot office and see if a PIC training session can be coordinated with maybe one of your, your subject matter expert at the local hot office and or uh, if there is a in, on the hot exchange, a webinar that you can actually select. Now, many of you feel about 50% that answered that you have enough data points for your occupancy numbers here for those that uh, have said no or have not participated, I recommend that you evaluate that particular process and spend some time with it and see what you can do to further enhance that. And I appreciate you taking the time to answer those poll questions. I want to open up the, the session here again for an opportunity for anybody that wishes to share some information in regards to the slides that we talked about. If not, we're moving on. I see no hands. I see no chat. No chat either. Okay. All right. Thank you, Helena. Mm -hmm. All right. Moving on in the next to the next slide in our presentation. Local market factors on occupancy. So again, this is a heavy session. This is a highlight on information that may be applicable to you or you have experienced throughout your career or where you live. And we thought it was a good opportunity to talk about that so you understand the additional variable points that affect your business. I say business specific because housing authorities are businesses. We are landlords. Next slide, please. Rural areas of opportunities or in short RAO. We talk about rural areas and sometimes forget about lack of certain items found in rural communities or how rural communities are affected by these particular factors. The official definition is region composed of rural communities that have been adversely affected negatively by extraordinary economic events or natural disasters. So you could be rural and have everything from internet service, you got all the fiber, uh, you have everything that you need access to, including housing, but for some reason you were affected by natural disasters that essentially wipes the infrastructure out. So that could be one factor. You could essentially have lack of affordable housing in your area to begin with because you could be an affluent rural community with million dollar homes and uh, we have hospitality and we have no affordable housing for hospitality staff to actually work in those jobs. So think of those impacts and effects that it could have. We could think of even areas, uh, beach towns that are affected by this, uh, especially during COVID and has lingered on where 
affordable housing is just not existing anymore. We know, I, I understand DC may be lo, lo, large, a large city, other largest cities where affordability of housing has literally diminished as a result of just how bustling the particular area is. I realize it's not rural, but I just want to put it in perspective when we talk about lack of affordable housing. Experience lower income levels, the, the wages depressed. We see that in the job market when we have an opening to fill and we want to get a, a experienced labor. And then the answer comes, well, I make so much more up north, northeast or out on the west coast. And then you come in the southern regions and the wages are just not there to keep up with you know, the demand of the wage request from the staff that we would love to hire that brings the experience. So just natural depression of income levels in your area. Experience loss of high paying jobs when an industry actually leaves the area or just vacates the area. Just imagine if Silicon Valley would to move out of California, what would that do? So just to put it in perspective, so there could be a high paying job entity in your business, in your area, in your communities. And when those jobs go away, what does that do to your area? And just the access of credit, just being able to have access for lending opportunities to expand or be able to support your intent of your business, the housing authorities or the staff in general that live in the rural areas and that could cause that, that kind of exodus to not uh, wanting to be in the area. So these are just some of those. Those are not all inclusive. These are just some of the ideas. Next slide, please. We have a little bit more in depth laid out. I talked about it briefly when I was given the overview. Industry scale backs are important, especially when it comes to manufacturing the low, low, low end paying jobs or lower on the scale, lower paying jobs, uh, especially also in the hospitality industry, that when those markets scale back, then the economic opportunity just does not exist. We also understand that the, the impact of not having children or the lack of children in the rural areas does not support the building of schools. So you may experience that in your community where access to schools, and this is not just, we're not just talking schools is in terms of traditional for elementary, middle school, and high school. This also could be your technical college or your community colleges or universities where these type of uh, schools are just further away or not there. And it makes it harder for the individual that seeks out those educational opportunities to actually wanting to be in, in that area. We know transportation is heavily affected by that when buses, trains, or other transit opportunities are just not there. And especially when you don't have a carpool opportunity as well to get to the job that you need to go there, the desirability to live in the rural areas are just not there. That makes our younger generation rethink whether they want to stay in the area where they were growing up safe and you know, surrounded by lots of nature and, and uh, just not having access to those particular uh, opportunities or transportation to get them from point A to point B, which then leads, of course, to job opportunities. Either the job opportunity is not matching up for their interest or the education is not there to allow them to compete with the job opportunity. So it's a variety of variables, factors that are impacting the particular decision-making process in the rural areas. Of course, housing authorities are sensitive to, well, if I have a vacancy and I need materials in general, just materials in general to maintain upkeep of the property and the vendors decide that you do not have access to, in your rural areas, to a Walmart, a Home Depot, a Lowe's, a HD supply, or somebody that is willing to bring the pieces to you uh, instead of you having to obtain them in the neighboring, uh, you know, 
town over or you have to drive an hour just to to get access to the supply that you need can be a factor for you so you want to definitely look at your supply chain but it can be an impact on your operations of course that you need to plan for or problem solve for and understanding whether your area is uh, an opportunity zone or not. If you're not deemed an opportunity zone, an investor is less likely to look into the area to provide uh, additional further opportunities through tax credits to, to build a business out there or have an Amazon warehouse out there. I'm just giving an example where that would be applicable for rural areas. That could also be a major employer then to provide those stable wages. We can't forget about rural, uh, the priority for rural and economic development initiatives. If you're not in those um, initiatives in those areas, then it makes it harder again, even for the housing authority to be able to, you know, make an argument for expansion of affordable housing. It may exist, but just not attainable. And then. Of course, stricken, as we have said, by disasters. Now, there's uh, plenty of materials out there that was already provided on the HUD exchange addressing disasters and other opportunities how to address them. But again, in rural areas where disaster strikes, it even becomes a greater problem solving issue for housing and occupancy in general, especially when the individuals really would love to stay in the areas and not move away. Next slide. Mm -hmm. There's um, a question here in the chat. Um, someone was asking, what is an appropriate amount for a staff benchmark incentive for occupancy? Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> how much can the bank pay? <laughs> What's realistic? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Right, but I have seen, uh, I look, I, I would say to this, to answer it a little bit more realistic, I would say, what do private managers do when they operate light tech units? And I have seen giving a small incentive anywhere from 25 to $50 a month to continue meeting benchmarks. I just say what I have seen from an experience, by all means, this is not the norm. But I have seen light tech operators evaluating their financial statements. I have seen something like that where it can be an incentive, even an incentive for on call coming in and making sure that the benchmarks are met, you know, can be given. And I have seen smaller amounts where we say this may be a little bit more realistic, but also not breaking the bank, the bank, 25 to $50 for certain benchmarks. So it really depends on the finances and if the property can break even, I would say. Thank you. You're welcome. Next slide, please. All right. We've talked about this a little bit, so I don't need to go over in depth more. We talked about uh, the challenges, of course, that the housing authorities are experiencing. We know about qualified staff, especially when we are looking for 10 years of experience and it's not there and we have to start from square one and we have to go through the education process. We know that uh, lack of resources and income can be a challenge, especially with the tenants as well, when the job opportunities are not there. And in general, access to technology, is, it's a big influence because some of the, the burdens I have um, witnessed out in California, when you're in the mountain area and your Wi-Fi is not stable and you don't have the fiber, it makes it very difficult for a housing authority to be able to have a handheld, unreliable Wi-Fi access and operate smoothly where you may have to continue a certain bureaucracy on paper, although we don't want to, but you may not have a choice out of necessity. So it becomes uh, just a burden in itself, but it could be twofold. It could be unreliability on, on access or just not having the, the fiber to the infrastructure to begin with. The inefficient processes, sometimes we don't want to maintain the process and sometimes you don't have a choice. Uh, but however, your local government and your board can be a challenge as well, especially when maybe how, not necessarily how they're appointed, but how well your partnership is running with those agencies where you need to rely on the board 
to help you push a certain agenda, especially in your rural area or in your city, in order to achieve what you are expected to achieve under the housing authority's umbrella on the HUD. So these challenges exist. Uh, they need to be resolved or managed effectively and can continue for many years and never be resolved. That's possible as well. But just to highlight on that we are understanding those challenges do exist. Next slide, please. The, some of the solutions for local markets and overcoming housing authority challenges we can offer in this presentation, and they're not uh, all inclusive, but especially when you're stricken by a disaster, and this is a highlight because there are, there is a special hot exchange session just on disaster and materials. When you have to rebuild units, of course, it's most critical and important when disaster strikes or where do the tenants go and what do you need, as, uh, especially partners and funding. FEMA, especially when it's, um, presidentially declared disaster, FEMA, you need your state, your city, your county. You definitely need to have a robust process around your insurance proceeds. You have to, you have to file your claims. You have to actively pursue the claims. You have to really not give up and and pound on somebody's door to say, okay, has the adjuster been out? Given this is a current issue in many areas where disaster strikes, Everything is reliant upon having an adjuster's report. Without an insurance adjuster report, you don't even get your FEMA project because it has to be acknowledged that the damages are covered, not covered in your policy. To what degree is your insurance proceeds? Do you need the adjuster's report? So this is the most um, critical piece to even move beyond to identify how much more money you may need through FEMA, the city, the state, or the county to fill the gap when you are looking for funding. And of course, the disaster mitigation funding for hardening, I bring that up because there is opportunity to actually do better. You can patch up and qualify to continuously insure the property, but what are we doing to help mitigate or strengthen, harden the property for the future that it can sustain the wind, uh, whether it's windows, doors, and roofs, that it can sustain a flood. Uh, so those kind of mitigation fundings are out there through the CDBG and the D disaster DR, so CDBG-DR or the mitigation funds, and of course, mitigation. FEMA has a team where they have mitigation experts that can help you discern what the RFP should look like to incorporate materials and improvements in the specifications to actually perform hardening. And there is funding out there for it. So as disastrous as it can be to be in this predicament, there is a light at the end of the tunnel by opportunity to strengthen and harden as well. Many times, and this is just a highlight again from the very in-depth uh, HUD exchange training that is offered in disasters, you do want to work with your nonprofits, your banks, your local partners uh, to assist your very, very low uh, to low income tenants, the vulnerables to help uh, with many things, whether if it's uh, disaster related immediate uh, assistance, but if it's not disaster related, banks are required to have nonprofit arms, development arms, and they do receive special funding or they have set aside funding to help you to do credit repairs for your low income tenant that can overcome the hurdle to be able to secure funding to do more, be able to afford the rent, be able to afford home ownership in the area and help them with the budget planning. So take advantage of that with your with your banks and local partners. Like I said, they have uh, nonprofit arms or development arms where this is possible and you want to partner with them. There are many great opportunities now out there for rural areas, including with HUD partnership and others that have joined and said we will give or through transportation we will ensure that we build a fiber and internet connectivity uh, network and there are grants out there 
uh, that, uh, you know, check with your city department, uh, city IT department. They may have point of contact for you or grant opportunities if you're not familiar with it or just scan through grants.gov and see what other grant opportunities are out there to expand uh, in your rural area or for your housing authority, even if you're not rural, on fiber and internet, con uh, internet connectivity. Uh, I know many large firms have partnered and said, we will do these things for low income tenants. If you meet this threshold on income, we will provide this opportunity for you. So explore that and uh, you know, help in the digital to conquer this digital divide initiative. Work with your city established uh, transportation pools or desirable or other desirable high paying jobs. You know, sometimes we don't think about, but when you have opportunity and you have a stadium there, that's a job opportunity. There can be a stable job opportunity. Your local technical schools may have pools of other employers that are lining up and knocking at the door and say, do you have graduates that need these kind of demands for our careers that we have? So check it out and see what opportunities exist there uh, through one-stop shops and career centers that may exist in your area. Although if you're rural, it may be your next largest city over, but it doesn't hurt to start those connections. Uh, Goodwill, Goodwill may have a, a huge present in your rural area and fill that gap for a one-stop shop or a career center that may not be there. So explore these and see what you have in your area. And then of course, your online school opportunities and universities. We have learned that employers are less frowning now on online degrees where that may not have been, you know, something that was desired to have an, uh, a graduate from an online where we just were kind of like, no, we, we want a traditional uh, graduate from a school or university, you know, look at those opportunities, those online school programs go a long way in filling the gap. Next slide, please. We have um, other partners, uh, collaboration. We were talking about peer review. So here, this goes again, another long way. You may be specifically looking on the dashboard to find another rural community and do knowledge sharing. Or when you go out and participate in your FADA, NARO, other conferences that you have in your area and you meet a colleague of yours, talk about those uh, knowledge sharings and collaborations on what can be done. Sometimes in rural areas, um, it is, you know, you may have a neighboring housing authority in close distance and you're competing uh, for the same market. You may have to collaborate or do agreements that not encroach into your line of business that you both can succeed and sometimes you can't. I mean, these are just options that we are throwing out there for you to consider. <clears throat> we also understand there are temporary agencies. I know they can be expensive. The markup, the overhead that they may charge for a staff person may be high, but it's an avenue to what we call test drive, a job seeker and be able to match their backgrounds to our need. And sometimes you can negotiate special rates if that's your preferred method. So you want to explore that through your procurement process and see if that's something that you can, you know, take advantage of or have access to because they exist in your area. Other opportunity exists through internship programs. This is a great opportunity when you are, especially like in the case management field, and you're looking for, or in, in HCV in your program, case managers you look, or case housing specialists, you're looking for individuals with certain skill sets and that they can fulfill and deal with your tenants and be able to uh, help them. You may want to offer internship programs for that uh, to your college, for your college that you have in the area to give you your work pool and then be able to groom that desired skill and transfer right into the workforce. It's a great opportunity. Sometimes I see employers pay a stipend to help offset transportation costs for that student. 
and some schools insist that it is an unpaid internship versus a paid internship. So see what you can do work with your HR if that's something that you want to explore on creating a pool of candidates to fill your vacancies. Uh, I've mentioned the community college, also the apprenticeship program. We know that with not many areas, um, you may not have a union in your area, or you may not have a specific apprenticeship program for the type of jobs that you need in the HVAC carpentry, painting, plumbing, electrician. So you want to look to your technical schools to see if they have these kind of programs and if they potentially have a maintenance program where you want to send your workers there or where you are able to provide an avenue for employment when they come out of this technical school program and you can hire them right there with all the skill sets that are necessary to do the functions that you need performed. Of course, the local journeyman chapter through the unions, you know, is always available. You know, force account has been around for a long time, is eligible. And uh, through the force account labor, the journeyman program, through the union program, you can secure agreements with them and have essentially access for qualified maintenance staff if you experience a shortage and you just need to, instead of contracting it out to a licensed contractor, you may be able to lessen the blow on the cost by going that route if that's available for your area. So again, force account labor, it's been around though, and a reminder, it has to be HUD approved. There's also a PowerPoint out there on the HUD exchange. You, you can look that up for on the training and uh, have force account labor, get a brush up on um, how, how to manage the process for force account labor. Wanna pause here. That was a lot of challenges, a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts. Anybody else want to add maybe something that they have done that was not mentioned, that would be a great point or agreeing that yes, these were all, uh, you know, things that you can explore or have explored in the past. Just want to pause here, see if we see anything. Helena, do you see anything? Hard to keep up with the chat at the same time. Yeah, no, nothing in the chat or Q and A box. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Well, no problem. Moving on, we got plenty of time. We're at about two thirty. Next slide, please. So here we are. This is a just a highlight on how we can start conversation for asset repositioning. By all means, this is not a presentation on asset repositioning or the, the intended purpose. This is just talking about another avenue, how to address occupancy, of which asset repositioning conversation is a tool. So we can't avoid it. So the next slide, we begin on asset reposition. And here we need to definitely consider or understand what is the agency's goal overall? Why do you think you need asset repositioning? And the answers are different for every housing authority on why they're doing it, whether it's a large housing authority, a medium sized housing authority, a small, whether you are in rules or in city areas, it does not matter. But generally, we have a desire to preserve, preserve affordable housing or replace obsolete housing. We know that our housing stock was created moons ago in the 30s and 40s, and uh, we have a need to take care of that housing and brush it up and, and make it better housing, right? We know some of it can be an eyesore, requires um, demolishing, demolition in general, or just in general stabilizing the neighborhood. But many housing authorities also have learned and said, well, we don't want to just give it away. We had private management, it doesn't work for us. We want to control the assets. So, you know, this is something that has to be part of the, the question as far as agency goal or why to do asset reposition. What are the impacts when we do that? Well, we know we talked about this uh, in, in presentations. If you had asset repositioning uh, presentations or RAD, if, if some of you started RAD conversion, 
you're migrating your public housing portfolio to the Section 8 program. So it's essentially uh, budget neutral. What does that mean? Budget neutral just means you take your public housing money, your capital fund money, you combine it, and you move that money that's otherwise allocated by HUD over to the Section 8 program to be administered. So you're migrating the portfolio over. But that is an opportunity because now you are expanding your Section 8 program. So think about that. Not having enough participating landlords can be a factor. You may not have um, other opportunities to, to have somebody run your portfolio as a landlord and or in, in general in Section 8, you may not have uh, additional too many landlords opportunities available because they're holding on to their own housing. The, the access or lack of access to a qualified management arm may not exist. And sometimes a investor will tell you, you must take my management arm. You know, everything is negotiable. So one, you never must, if it's approved, it's approved. It's always in the argument and how strong you can demonstrate that you can manage your own portfolio, even if you go through the light tech process. And then the loss of the fee income for your overhead, that's a consequence. Because when you are in the fee-for-service model or have a COCC, Central Office Cost Center, when you are converting your portfolio, you lose fee income. That has to be supplemented somehow to cover the overhead activity, such as your IT, your HR, your procurement, your finance, the executive staff. So. Think about those uh, matters as well. They have to be addressed. Uh, it can contribute to a job loss in your area when you are no longer operating the asset yourself and you are converting it and it's on the private management. There's no guarantee that the employee will be absorbed by the private management arm. And of course, sometimes it's less. Uh, efficient and streamlined operation, it can occur that uh, it, it's an argument, something to review and say, will we suffer a negative consequence by going through this particular conversion process? So in general, asset repositioning does bring a lot of questions. Uh, and these are just some examples of the questions to consider uh, the impact for your authority. Next slide, please. For public housing, asset repositioning is a positive tool because it allows thousands of families not lose access to housing and essentially can provide better maintained units and creating opportunities, especially when we leverage with the public and private source resources, when we are creating uh, essentially a um, rehab opportunity or rebuild opportunity when we're going through asset repositioning. It can ease administration. And of course, the biggest factor always is that no matter what, when even when the program is shifting from public housing to Section 8, we are preserving affordable housing. That affordable housing does not go away. We are um, just moving, like I said, in the big picture from the housing platform to HCB, and there's two main tools that you can use. You can project base them yourself on the PVB with a HAP contract that can now go up to 20 years, so from 15 to 20, which is a very interesting financing tool when it comes to considering, um, you know, lend, uh, having to finance your project. It's, it's a guaranteed HAP contract that you administer at your own authority. Yes, it comes with a little bit of extra work that you have to comply with, but you can, it, it adds to your baseline of your housing choice voucher program. And as you know, 20% of that portfolio can be PBV. It can provide more fee and more stable uh, fee income for the housing authority. And then of course you have the project-based rental assistance, the PBRA program, where you still have to have contract up to 20 years, but then it's essentially administered through HUD and it goes uh, through the track system, T-R-A-C-S, because we like our alphabet soup, where you then obtain the funding. And of course it comes with its own compliance requirements when you're under PBRA. But those are the two main tools. It helps 
to preserve their affordable housing, and it can help to address the rehabilitation and physical needs that are identified when you go through the RAD conversion process for this kind of initiative. And uh, the, the biggest piece really is it's supposed to, and I say this, place the property on the more stable foundation. It is the expectation when the performer is created that the financial foundation is stronger in the property because you're combining the public housing funds with the capital funds. And then, of course, depending on the type of mix that you create um, to have more income resources coming into the property, a sound financial foundation, so you're able to serve debt. Because uh, in most, most cases, you have to take on debt. Next slide, please. What is a program closeout? That is another tool that is available for small housing authorities. And it essentially is removing the public housing annual contribution contract and actually consolidates it or terminates it. The particular PIH notice addressing this particular option is PIH notice 2019-13. And uh, there is a, a hot link in the resource sli uh, slide for you when you have access. Once it's posted on the hot exchange, you can save it in your favorites and go through this notice. It's very long. It's, it's a long read, but it will provide you all the necessary details on program closeout. The housing authority will still exist because most likely you have a Section 8 program. And of course, whatever you do through RAT conversion, uh, you still have to uh, report on it. So the housing authority does not go away. Uh, it is locally established government entity. So uh, you, some of you may not operate a housing choice voucher program, but you still have a financial component that you would have to report on. So it really depends on the setup of your housing authorities. Uh, your housing authority, though, cannot develop uh, additional public housing units, regardless of its fair cloth unit uh, or limit uh, limit count for your units to be created. So once you choose that option, there is no more ability to create public housing unit. That option is closed. And then your uh, PHA needs a plan for its remaining public housing funding grants that you may have, uh, the public housing assets that you have on the books, whether you have OPEB or no OPEB, uh, any other housing programs that you carry, as well as your potential office uh, cost center or insured COCC. So it does come with some stuff, I say, but it can all be sorted out and it's a tool. It's a consideration. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Sometimes we ask, why do we convert and what benefits of closing out asset repositioning will provide? <clears throat> Excuse me. The property can be stabilized. You can have a stable financial platform going through asset repositioning, guaranteed funding. I told you that the HEP contracts can go up to 20 years and they can be renewed. Reliable income stream for operations is something that you can count and budget on. There is a lot of uh, leveraging opportunities through many different processes, including the light tech market. You have uh, preservation and uh, other resources that you can keep, like your equipment and fixtures. You can potentially preserve for DTTF funding, that's your demolition and disposition traditional funding and asset repositioning fees. You can also have transfer of assets and liabilities to newly created housing authorities. And this particular PIH notice is a little older, but the information is contained in PIH notice 2014-24. So there's no change, has not been updated. It still applies. And of course, the local control and flexibility to meet the local needs can be matched under this particular uh, asset repositioning model as needed. And it's supposed to provide administrative relief because things are supposed to be simplified. I say supposed because sometimes we can't just be our greatest enemy and just create more administrative burden, but the intent always is to create administrative relief 
from asset repositioning to simplify because it's going from this model to the Section 8 model. Next slide, please. Um, conversion options. So there are two forms that are required and optional. The Section 18 disposition uh, is available for housing authorities that have less than 50 units on the justification. Then the Section 22 streamlined voluntary conversion, you can voluntary uh, start the conversion process. And uh, those are available for housing authorities with 250 units and under. And then on the red, uh, the red demonstration, the rental assistance demonstration program streamlined process available. There's a separate process for housing authorities with less than less than 50 units. And where red is there for all public housing units to be converted and has no authority to develop new units on the fair cloth. So it's just a reminder that if you convert your full portfolio, it would apply there the same way. It is optional when you remove your current public housing units under the repositioning tools and has a fair cloth authority and a plan to develop new public housing units. So there's always a little bit of a caveat. It may not apply. Nevertheless, it's something that we want to list that uh, it's, the, it's, it's optional under other repositioning tools. Next slide, please. We want to highlight the options under the RAT PBV. I've mentioned a few of those. And uh, again, it's administered by the housing authority if you have a, a housing trust voucher program. And if not, then I guess you would have one because you have a PBV contract. The initial term, as I was saying, has increased from the 15 years. It can be up to 20 years. The initial rent cap can be 110% of the fair market rents. The rents are adjusted annually by the operating cost adjustment factor. For us that's been in the industry, we just say OCAF. So there's an annual inflation factor and you request this on an annual basis. So your rents or the amount of funding that is being received by the housing authority based on a PVV unit will be adjusted by HUD by providing you that inflation factor. Um, you have to request it though. And then you have choice mobility availability after one year. So the tenant has the opportunity that can be a burden for the um, housing authority, how to maintain choice mobility. And you have a unit term now, right? Because a tenant may opt for this particular option to now say, I only stay in that unit for a year and then I want to move because that vehicle does exist on the Section 8. Um, but the unit stays with the project. So the unit does not go away. The individual just has a voucher and you can house a new tenant. You just now have to deal with unit turnover. And then the PHA must give the PB, PBV tenant requesting a voucher first priority on the PAH voucher waitlist. So this again can be an administrative burden where we wanted to create administrative relief. That is one of the other flip side of the coin where we have to now manage a different situation. We have to now manage wait lists. Next slide. On the project based rental assistance contracts, PBRA. Uh, we, are, we are administered by HUD office, uh, HUD office of housing. The initial contract term 20 years and it's mandatory for renewal. So that's a very interesting appealing financing tool as said. The initial rent cap may not exceed 120% of the fair market rents. And of course will be adjusted annually by OCAP. Again, you have to request it. So it's not just an automatic, you're entitled to it, but it has to be requested. Choice mobility permits tenants to move after 24 months. So at least you know for the first 24 months, you do not have vacates unless voluntary uh, vacates occur from other reasons than choice mobility after 24 months. And the 
the again the voucher stays or the, the, the unit stays with the project because it's project-based assistance. It is subject to REAC inspections and UPCS inspections as far as a protocol to maintain, uh, of course, the viability of the um, housing or your project. And it is subject to management and occupancy reviews, the MORs. These are like the mini audits uh, performed compliances to ensure that whomever manages it, whether if it's privately managed or managed by the housing authorities, that you are administering to the standard. And those are your mini audits. These letters are not fun. They have to be, you, you cannot be delinquent in your annual certification processes and any other, uh, you know, income certifications requirements and everything else that's required. So you have to go through that. You just have to be on point with that or your management arm, because these letters can get extensive and pages long for deficiencies. So that's an administrative burden, but it has to be done. And uh, it is subject to annual financial statements. Many of them that in your financial data schedule will end up on the delight tech as discrete components. So they have their own financial statement requirements. These are very uh, strict or very short timelines whereby many of these processes for audit or for financial statement submission have to have to be completed by end of February in, in draft, for example, tax returns filed and uh, no later than 120 days after your calendar year is completed. So these are just things that come with this kind of uh, model under the PBRA. Next slide, please. We have other options and other opportunities as a result of red conversion because it always allows us to raise money. There is many leveraging opportunities out there that you may have heard already or you have experienced already. Under the government leveraging, you can raise equity through tax credits with your state uh, by making tax credit application. Not a fun process, but again, it can be done whether it's a 4% tax credit deal or 9% tax credit deal, bonds versus competition. Other appropriation of funds that can be used to help supplement and do a rehab, sometimes the building doesn't need a lot and uh, it's not a complete rehab. So there's other opportunities available or other pu public entity con contributions. In the private leveraging, you have uh, unsubsidized funding that includes your FHA insured uh, financing, commercial mortgage debt, don't count out to your banks. Always check with them. They usually have a private development arm. They are less in fees, less in restriction. You may pay a little bit more on interest, but can be a great partner by removing some of the other requirements. You can also consider deferring developer fees or have other private sources. You don't know you have a philanthropist in your area and uh, they just have that particular initiative and they will provide the necessary funding. We also know under current conditions, especially with the disasters, many funds were made available through the government arm that flow through the state to uh, the county or city uh, where you can actually seek additional funding for new housing development. So keep up with your current uh, changes in your area as a result of funding and what comes down through appropriations, the funding opportunities. Next slide, please. On the simplification uh, for RAD or asset repositioning, just in general, the, the ongoing public stewardship, because it doesn't go, go away. We have talked about that being able to maintain affordable housing is important. And of course, it provides a public stewardship, the necessity and ensure that that affordable housing is stabilized and, and maintained to continue only paying 30% of the adjusted income towards rent by the tenant, and then guaranteeing the same basic rights for the tenants. So these are argument points that can be conveyed to tenants to why this is 
a good thing for them and the housing authority why to go through that when you have your required tenant meetings that they remain affordable and they cannot be kicked out they have their rights there is no cap on expiration so it will stay um, affordable housing as long as it's required uh, done through your legal documents identified as affordable housing uh, convert the HUD rental assistance into project-based Section 8 or project-based voucher program, as I've talked about the PBE versus the PERA, and the relief from the public housing regulation, that side of the house, and uh, the HUD scoring that uh, we may dread, but those rules that limit us uh, to use the assets and the personnel, how it can be used. It allows developers to qualify for additional financing. It makes it easier under that particular model on the red conversion. And I had mentioned the light tech program. So it's very appealing, very attractive to many investors. Now, given in a rising interest rate market, it is still appealing. The light tech uh, tax credit uh, amount of return that's being given is still strong. It's still holding. So it can still be in a higher interest rate market appealing you just may want to uh, negotiate better uh, opportunities for refinancing opportunities when the interest goes down and uh, you want to do refinancing to decrease the amount of debt burden that you have when you have to repay your loans and the interest. So that's something to keep an eye on uh, for that, but it still can be very appealing even in rising interest rate market. I want to pause here for a second because again, this is very happy, and we're about to come on the 3 o'clock mark, and we are almost finished, almost through, but I want to still pause and give an opportunity if anybody has a question or a comment that they want to throw out. If not, we're moving right through. Next slide, please. The RAD Section 18 blend uh, that is offered it's an expansion opportunity, and you can combine the two important PIH notices to read about is 2021-07 and 2018-04. And I've heard the phrase, if it's if it crosses your mind, if you think you have a question about it, as the RAD resource desk, we can probably make it work. So don't shy away from that term or terminology. It basically combines the blend for construction and small PHA blends can be very um, uh, quick tool to use. Uh, it must be replaced with PBV, red one for one replacement. All residents receive the same robust red rights and protection. That's very important. And of course, contribute public housing funds into the development budget. That's very appealing. And the the blends are analyzed at the project level as a percentage eligibility of Section 8 for construction and rehabilitation uh, Rehabilitation cost. There's a template out there that's also available on the RAD resource test. It's the HCC template, so you can do your own test to see if you qualify. Not that hard to do, very simple. If, if those that have done mixed uh, income before under the old HOPE 6, same template. Next slide, please. The streamlined voluntary conversion uh, on that, on the section 22, the tenant receives the same tenant protection rights. So we see a common theme available to housing authorities with 250 units or less. It creates greater flexibility and the local need to address the local need. And it might be available for asset repositioning fees, which you know you can get for three years after that. So you can plan for that and use those funds to help essentially finance the deal as well and will not be eligible for dem a demolition and disp a disposition transition of funding or what we know the dttf there you want to reference or read up on the pih notice 2019-05 again these uh, this, these kind of slides are here to help you brainstorm and give you the relevant data points to allow you to read research and ask questions Next slide, please. So we have a few questions popping up here in the chat. 
Okay, but before we do that, I want to ask on time because I know we have only so much time blocked out and I want to make sure that even if we were to go over a little bit, it's not a problem. Because I have time. I think we, we try to finish up SIG and uh, even okay. if we go maybe 5 minutes over. Okay. Um, I, okay. Let's try to get through the rest of the slides up to the polls and okay. the rest of the slides that follow our information also okay since this uh, is going to be posted a lot later the date um we can quickly skip through those uh, final slides okay. all right if we don't get to all the questions if they're a little bit too much in depth uh no worries we answer all the questions that are in the chat and follow up and email them out for you so we will try we have about uh 10 10 less than 15 minutes what are the the questions so Maybe. the first one is that someone would like to know about the calculations for tenants project base. Yeah, we should answer that in writing. Okay. And then the next one here I have is, um, uh, this actually might not be relevant to you. This is they're asking for information about where to get note information from HUD in terms of okay. updates on PIH notices. <clears throat> so, yeah. So I would, I would, if you have uh, questions related to PIH notices, Google is your friend. Type mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. hot PIH notices. Boom, link pops up. You can have every year and uh, go through the, go through those um, PIH notices and find them. But we also have created the hyperlinks in the document and a resource slide so you can pull them up. But the very small PIHAs, what do they have available? They have section 18. They have a streamlined red. They have a section 18 for small PHA blend, and they have the streamlined voluntary conversion. Those are your options for those that are less than 50 units. Between 51 and 250, it's your RAD section 18 small PHA blend, streamlined voluntary conversion, RAD conversion, and section 18 scattered sites. So that's important to know, so you know when you read up on it whether you're in that group or not. Next slide, please. All right best practices, you definitely want to make sure that whatever you do, you have your annual plan and your admin plan updated. If you have it in your annual plan and it's not in your admin plan, uh, somebody will stop you in the process. So always make sure that both of these pieces are updated at the same time. That will keep you out of the hot water and not forget what you need to do. In communication, you always want to communicate with your board, educate them attend the training session, do the HUD exchange, go to the RAD resource, do do a uh, spend some time, request a TA. Definitely when you know all your details and only when you understand yourself, hold the tenant communication. We do not want to spread fear, nor do we want to create fear. When you can't answer the questions, the potential questions, you do not want to communicate with the tenant. But uh, when you're ready to hold that conversation, always engage with the tenants and your partners that you have selected or you want to work with. Who are your partners? They are your local hot office. You start the conversation, you discuss your options. They can give you a lot of tools and information uh, and build upon from this presentation. Developers that you need to procure, you need to, you need to seek them out. You have your RAD resource team, as I was just talking about the RAD resource desk. Oodles of information, I say oodles, it's really a lot of information already out there. Evaluate all information on ap applicability, and this is something that you truly want to go through. Access to funding is how you pay for the RAD conversion, especially when you have rehabilitation. So all these pieces have to be, they're an action plan. It comes with busy stuff. I say busy stuff because they're intense because you're going through a rehab and that comes with, with contracts and monitoring budgets and so forth. So you also need to think about your workforce. Next slide, please. Other requirements, you will be required to have a capital needs assessment, and we have addressed it in uh, one through four presentations, the webinars that are already out there on Hot Exchange. There's an extens uh, extensive webinar just dedicated to the, the capital needs assessment. You need healthy housing and energy efficiency. 
uh, performed, environmental reviews done, because it is a disposition, substantial conversion of assistance and the amount of uh, cannot reduce the number of units assistant because we just heard one for one. So there is relocation, accessibility, demolition, change in unit configuration, ownership and controls that change, RAD use agreement. These are new word, new buzzwords. Uh, the Davis Bacon prevailing wage will apply on the RAD conversion, and then you let base paint hazards. Financing requirements is a whole nother set of uh, requirements and considerations that have to be given based on which financing route you give, it can be complex and it can be simple. And sometimes you need a relocation plan. Uh, you know, sometimes you you have to, you can convert in place, uh, but that comes with a burden to the tenant and may take longer. And sometimes it's more convenient to relocate. Other next slide, please. Polls, quick poll. If we can shorten the poll, that would be great. But um, have you been impacted by local changes? We do want to hear yes or no. These are very simple uh, bubbles to fill in. Are you planning on repositioning? We're just trying to get an idea of the percentage. Does this presentation help with making a decision? Because we want to provide useful tools for you and your housing authority to you've thought about it, you have more information, you feel better equipped to hold the conversation including your board and your team members and explore and go down this path. And it may not be a short-term goal that you have, but let's say a more long-term goal over the next three years, you want to develop all the answers that you need to be very uh, robust and being able to answer questions. So the poll is open, yes, no, help us to understand where you fall in and and share with us. We have another, oh, okay, there you go. We have already some answers. Have you been impacted by disaster or local changes? No, so that's good. Um, are you planning on doing this? Yes, uh, no, about 50-50 from those that answered and the presentation was helpful, which is great and I appreciate that. Next slide, please. We're coming down towards the end and then can see if we can answer another question. We have resources for you. Once it's published, we have the alphabet soup glossary posted for you. So no worries, that is available. And then of course, uh, all the notices, all the information that I talked about today, including the accounting brief or the SAC link, how to do the uh, demo dispo applications is over two slides. When you see it blue highlighted, that means they're hyperlinked. You can save it in your favorites. Once it's available, your PIH notices. So uh, plenty of reading material. There is a great, I wanna highlight this, asset reposition for small PHA with closeout caption on YouTube. You may need to talk to your IT, you may be blocked, but this is a great link. It breaks down a hot session and goes in very in depth on asset repositioning for small PHAs. So with that, next slide is just saying last opportunity for a question. Helena, do we have one that we might be able to squeeze in? We're right. I don't think so, unfortunately. I am recommending folks to just um, submit questions. I provided the email address that's also here on the slide right now that if you have additional questions, feel free to submit to that email, please. Right, so if we could leave that up for a second, hotcc.trainings at IEM.com. Don't forget to use subject line PHA occupancy TA post training. Put your question, identify your name, where you're from, your phone number, your, your email, of course, will be uh, listed so we can respond back to you and we will publish the Q&A list for you or call you directly if we are not able to discern what, what the question is. So we will be able to respond back. With that, I'm closing out. I truly appreciate your attendance today. Well, you could have done many other things, but you chose to attend this session today. And I hope this was as exciting to you as it was to me to give the presentation. I really appreciate it. Again, have a great afternoon. Thank you for joining. Bye.